part of the techniques used in artificial intelligence. And the problem sorry. Okay. The problem with artificial intelligence, I think, is expectations are too big. If you think about artificial intelligence, probably you think about the Terminator or you think about uh, the Matrix or some uh, any cool science fiction movie. But usually uh, it's something much more mundane. And when we talk about machine learning, are very easy techniques that you can use in your research, and they are very useful. And at the same time, are used in uh, a lot of different fields for research and in some products as well. Um, here I have one example. If you heard about this company, Sip Science, basically, is a startup uh, from some ex-Google employees. And what they do, they use machine learning for detecting, in this case, fraud. If your network is suspicious of being infected, if some domain is suspicious of being uh, distributing malware, in this case, they are using machine learning. But looks like machine learning is uh, something big used for big companies, for big staff. But basically, the aim for me today with this talk is to show you how you can apply these techniques in your day-to-day -day research and get in some good results with very easy uh, tools to use. Um, don't get afraid by the big words, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and everything. And this is the end of this talk, to show you how you can apply this for your day-to-day -day research. OK, so as I said, um, we will be talking about fraud in Twitter and uh, doing some machine learning over that. So the first thing is why Twitter? And the reason is that, well, I don't need to tell you these days why Twitter is important or is relevant. It's one of the biggest social networks in the world, but I would like to show you some of the figures. You can see they have over 500 uh, million users, and they are sending like 175 million tweets a day, which is quite a big number. Um, also, another reason for this uh, research over Twitter is because it's very easy to work over this social network, because all the information is public. They have free API you can use to retrieve information, and you can just browse the web and get information for the different profiles and everything. So basically, all the information is easily uh, reachable for you. Um, so let's take a look what kind of fraud we can, pro uh, we can find in, in Twitter these days. And the first one will be a spam. And um, when we talk about big numbers, like if you heard from the past, 99% of all email messages are spam messages and this kind of stuff. Nobody really knows. Nobody has the power to know how much of the data is uh, spam or not, which is malicious or not. We have like different pieces, and we try to put all this information together. But from our stats, I can show you that in Kaspersky, for instance, we are seeing how spam is decreasing like 10% uh, in the last couple of years, which is uh, quite a lot. And at the same time, we saw how uh, the spam in social networks increase uh, by 10% as well. There is no direct correlation between these two uh, numbers, but you can see how there is like a new parting, and the attackers are moving from email messages to social networks. And there is a good reason for that. Basically, all of us during the last years uh, have learned that every email message that we get could be malicious. Any attachment could be malicious. We should delete it. We should not open any link inside the email message. But when we receive a um, tweet from a friend of us, or when we receive some uh, recommendation for Facebook, we just open it blindly. So for the attackers, it's much better just to move to social networks, because there is a um, trust level that we have to our social relationships in the social network. And at the same time, we don't have the same quality tools that we already have for uh, email messages. I remember I read in the, I don't remember where, but there was an interesting article saying that the spammers were moving from email to buying advertisement in social networks because the return of investment was biggest, even using uh, legitimate advertisements than just sending blindly a spam to users. If we take a look to the uh, Twitter stats, we see that in the, from 2009, they had a peak uh, between 9 and 10% of spam in the tweets that they detected. And they started working on that, and they reduced significantly the spam level in the social network. 
to around 1%. But now, remember that 1% 1 of 175 million tweets a day is 1.75 million tweets a day sent in a spam, which is quite a big number. Unfortunately, this figure is only uh, from uh, 2010. Uh, this is from Twitter. They have not published anything else since there. I don't know if this figure is worse these days or not, but anyway. Um, just to show you, this is just funny, but just to show you how the media sometimes wants to make the big headlines. Okay. You can see that uh, in this newspaper, they were saying that 3.5 billion malicious tweets were spread uh, spreading spam and viruses every day, which is quite funny because only 175 million tweets are sent every day. But you cannot trust the big numbers. Okay, so for sending a spam, this is one of the reasons that we have fraud in Twitter, but also for sending viruses. In this case, this malicious content is not, it's much more aggressive, right? If you are sending a virus trying to infect a victim, um, well, in this case, the whole AV industry, the whole security industry will quickly jump into this campaign, will shut down all the domains, will create signatures for this malware, and the campaign will not go far away. But in the case of a spam, it's like, ah, this gray area is not that malicious, so should we shut down the domains? Because this is of obviously has a cost for the company who is shutting down the domains. So who is doing that? Who is taking the action for shutting down the domains and shutting down the campaign? Of course, uh, it's in the interest of Twitter to do that, but not so many other companies. And that's why for virus, it's much more rare that we see this kind of campaigns than for spam. Uh, in this case, this is a real campaign uh, from last year. Basically, you can see the messages. I uh, hope you can see them. Uh, online virus check, and basically it was a uh, drug AV. Um, Nothing very interesting here. Okay, so for both sending a spam and viruses, you can use both uh, bots, automatically created bots, just sending a spam, trying to impersonate a, a, a real user, or you can use hack accounts. In the case of hack accounts, of course, it's much better for the attacker because it's more difficult for the victim to distinguish that the profile that sent him the message is real or not. So you can see that some campaigns like this one are using incredible original baits like lol funny pic of you and then just put in this uh, shortened URL and obviously you will land in a page like this one using this campaign. Just asking for your username and password and this way they get more profiles and the thing keeps rolling. Any thoughts, anything else interesting in Twitter? Um, this is from, well, if you read Secure List in our blog, we published a campaign, uh, we call it Mini Duke, and they were using zero day uh, exploits in Adobe for infecting users. And in this case, when you get infected, the way that this malware has to communicate to the CNC was to look into Twitter for this string, URI and exclamation sign, and the rest of the string was in uh, the CNC domain in an encrypted form. So this way they were able to have, um, well, Twitter is always reachable, it's not suspicious, and well, you're basically abusing a well-known platform for having communication with your, with your bots. What else? Well, if you are in, if you are in marketing, and this is marketing is digital marketing, you probably are reporting to your boss a lot of numbers, like we have so many followers, and this percentage of the followers has like a positive impression of our company, and we increase the number of positive uh, comments on the internet, blah, blah, blah. And basically, you just are presenting a very nice chart to your boss, uh, trying to explain how your work uh, actually works. And in order to do that, fake profiles are very interesting for you, and there are a lot of companies offering, offering this for you as well. Uh, in this case, this is from a real campaign in Spain, 
uh, for Telefonica. Probably you know Telefonica is a big uh, telephone, co uh, telephone company. Um, they have a very bad reputation between people because of the crappy service. But in this case, they wanted to improve that by creating fake profiles like this one. If you like tennis, this Sarah C69 is uh, Maria Sharapova. It's a Russian uh, tennis player. And basically, it's a fake profile. And she was like only saying positive comments about Telefonica on the internet. And like her, there were a lot of other um, fake profiles doing the same thing. Uh, this was um, quite interesting. Uh, but it's digital marketing, right? It's legitimate. Are companies offering this kind of services? Hacktivism, of course. Do you know Nicolas Maduro? He is the new uh, Venezuelan uh, president. In this case, his account was hacked uh, this Monday, I think. And there was a big controversy in the election because he says that the election was not fair and, well, you can imagine. And in this case, it was hacked by Lulsec uh, Peru. And they were sending messages like uh, electoral fraud and everything. So you can see that these profiles are of big interest for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And if there is interest for something, of course, there is a price. And in the underground market, you can find this kind of services. They are not so hidden, so it's very easy for, for you to find them out. And you can get like 100,000 uh, followers for 150 US dollars. So if you are in digital marketing, this is of your interest. There are also so many tools um, to get more profiles. In this case, this is a brute forcer, the hack Twitter. Just download the tool, put the profile name that you want to hack, and just we'll do a, a brute forcing attack against the Twitter and trying to get the, the password. And it's interesting because this tool is 100% clean. No viruses, no malware, which is good, right? And of course, there's a third method. In this case, if you are able to hack into Twitter, you will be able to get the passwords. And this happened this February. They were using the attackers at zero day in Java. Surprise. And they were able to steal 250,000 hashes of passwords. Um, well. There were not much more details about that later. But of course, this is another way for getting a lot of uh, accounts. OK, so let me tell you an example of a random campaign. This happened to me, actually. And that's why I got interested into this kind of research. And I did this presentation later. And basically, that happened to me last summer. I was just retweeting this, uh, this tweet about the StarCraft II. Is offering to factor authentication, so my video game now has stronger authentication than my bank. So it was very funny. I just repeated it, and immediately I got this answer from Janita Fest Get your free Diablo 3 game here. And of course, usually I don't get uh, any tweet from a girl like Janita Fest. Um, I got suspicious immediately. So I checked his account, uh, her account, sorry, and I was able to find that she was sending this kind of messages along with other random messages, just trying to disguise that she was a bot. But looking for these random messages into Twitter, I was able to discover all the profiles doing exactly the same, not for the Diablo 3 in this case, but for other uh, products such as Xbox, Mac, iPhone, um, Dell and everything. So I put all the profiles together, and I found that most of them were using um, attractive pictures of girls. Um, but there were a lot of them, and they were all doing exactly the same. Some messages promoting some campaigns, and some messages trying to simulate chit chat with another with another user. Um, so what I did is okay. This is interesting. I started uh, collecting all these profiles. I put them in a database, and I took a look to some of the data that, that I got from there. The first interesting thing is that the half-life of these bots, for half of them, was less than 45 minutes, meaning that they were immediately shut down from, uh, by Twitter, in this case, uh, when they were discovered to be fake profiles just sending a spam. Some others were luckier and they stayed for more than one hour and a half 
but you can see that they were like one shot bots. Just created, sending some messages to some people, and then shut down. And this is interesting because in this case, when you are sending a spam using mail, you don't have information about your victim. But if you are sending this kind of messages in Twitter, you can have access to the victim uh, tweet line. So you can read the previous messages, and if they are talking of something that could be related to your campaign, you do semantic analysis, and then you send the spam message, which in return will get you uh, better, um, uh, how to say, infection ratio? No, victim, uh, Roy, okay, everything is right this time. Anyway, so if you follow the link, you will end in a website like this one, get the upload free for free, and you will ask for the zip code and then for your email address. And you will stay, uh, you will enter into a lottery and you will have some chances of getting the other free. So at this point I was thinking, hmm, uh, this is not like buy Viagra. I mean, uh, I can understand the model behind buy Viagra if I, uh, I get a, a, a percentage of the, of, the, of the sales of Viagra. But in this case, how is this uh, spam bot making money? Who is paying him for this Diablo 3 thing? So I discovered that there were some campaigns, like this one from Flux Ads. Um, you can see here that they were looking for people in the United States. The payable action is email submission, and they were paying $1.3 for every email submission from the United States. Oh, strange, why is that? And first of all, who is Flux Ads? So Flux Advertising is uh, online, marketing, whatever. Um, they were also offering some other campaigns, like in this case for uh, Visa Gifts. For, in this case, they were paying 1.35 um, US dollars for the same for email submission. Um, why is that? So let me explain you why is people paying for email submissions related to these things. But I need to take a small detour in this case because this is related to privacy. So we will get back to the Twitter world in a few minutes. Okay, so let me explain you how tracking works. Basically, you probably know about that. If you are visiting any website, this is a well-known Spanish news newspaper. You are visiting a lot of different domains. Some of these domains are related to the contents of the newspaper. Some of them are from advertisement companies. Um, when you are visiting this website, if you have some cookies from any of these uh, advertisement companies, or you have some cookies, let's say, from Facebook, you are sending this information to Facebook or to these advertisement companies. So they know your browsing history. They know your interest. Every time you see the I like button in any website, you're sending your uh, ID to Facebook. So they know that you've been visiting this website. Um, of course, cookies is not the only way to do that. There are much more advanced tracking techniques, like with passive data, for instance. You can see the headers, you can see the operating system. You can use JavaScript for the screen resolution. You can see the shares, the printer. You can use HTML5 storage. You can use Java. You can use a lot of methods. According to this uh, study, only with the headers, only with passive data, it was possible to identify 86% of, uh, uniquely identify 86% of all the people who was in this study. Um, sometimes it's really tricky. For instance, um, Omniture is an advertisement company owned by Adobe, and they were using this domain for sending track data. And this domain, if you cannot read it, is 192.168.112.207.net. But the O is not a zero, it's an O. So you can imagine how this domain will basically trick all the different uh, filters that any system administrator has for a good reason. So they are playing dirty tricks just to allow this information to go through. 
But usually this tracking is not necessary at this level, and just with cookies is enough for uh, advertisers to, to know where you've been and your browsing history. If you take a look to the advertisement um, market, there are a lot of different companies. Some of them are tracking you online. So they know your browsing history, they know where you've been, the websites that you've been visiting. But some of them are getting this data from the real world. For instance, if you go to um, Walmart and you are in the premium club, or whatever, and, and that's figuring out, and you put your email address for receiving the best offers or something like that, then there is something that they can use to link you with your digital uh, persona, with uh, your digital uh, identification. So that's why they are paying you uh, for submitting your email address. Because when you were visiting the Diablo 3 website, you were putting your email address, and you were getting this cookie. So they were able to track you uh, on, the, on your browsing history, and with your email address, they are able to get your data from the real world. So perfect matching, and they can create a profile of you. And these profiles are very powerful. You can imagine who is the most powerful profiling company these days. Uh, of course, is Google. And you can see how the request to Google by different uh, governments has been increasing year by year. They are making this data public. They are not saying what kind of data they are sending to the governments. And of course, the top government asking data to Google is the US. Um, the reason is that Google at this point has more information over human individuals that anyone else has had in the human history. Just think about that. If you do Alt-Tab, when you think the, <laughs> the door open, just think that there is no such thing uh, against Google. When you, are, when you are visiting porno, wherever, they track you, they know where you've been. So in this case, you cannot escape Google. OK, so let's come back to Twitter. If you remember, I just explained you why people is paying for you for submitting the email address because they want to create your, the, the profile. But let's go back to Twitter and let's continue with the experiment. Okay, so after I received this uh, tweet that I uh, showed you before, my experiment started. What I did is I tracked during three months as many malicious campaigns as I could find. So in this case, were 36 malicious campaigns. And I collected uh, 3, 1,500 profiles, 200,000 tweets, and six and a half million relationships of the different um, profiles involved in malicious campaigns. So I put all of this in a database. And what I wanted to do is, is it possible to detect malicious profiles using machine learning techniques? So in case that you are not familiar with machine learning, just let me uh, explain you a, a couple of things. Basically, we use machine learning for classification. In this case, we use supervised, meaning that we just um, get all the samples that we have and we put a tag into them. So basically, we color the different samples. These are good, these are malicious. And then we select some features for every sample. So our algorithm may learn which ones are malicious and which ones are OK based on these features. So you can see from here that the feature selection is very important. Basically, with machine learning, you don't generate new knowledge. You need to put all, the, all your knowledge over the given area you are studying before starting the machine learning to, to happen. Basically, um, the algorithms that you are using for machine learning are not very intelligent. What they do is just try to differentiate with a given function in the space that you are studying. So they can put uh, uh, an, are an area for the different tasks that you are putting in your training, in your training set. So if you use, for instance, the name of the sample of the profile, 
or trying to differentiate between the malicious and the good profiles, probably this is not a very good strategy. You should try to get better features. However, you cannot use an unlimited set of features because if you use too many of them, you put a lot of noise into the model. So it's very difficult to distinguish which features are good and which ones are bad. And also, um, there is a lot of computational power needed for uh, calculate the function depending on the number of features. So you should try to get a minimum set of features that is um, optimal for the problem that you're trying to, to address. Uh, in, the, in this case, just let me show you the, the, the different uh, features that we have. We have some features that we get from Twitter. If you visit any Twitter profile, you will get all these features, including the username, the image, and the profile, twist count, the full name, the number of following, followers, uh, the tweet send, if it is protected or not, etc., etc. And then there is a second set of uh, derived uh, features that I thought that may be interested for this given problem that we are addressing. In this case, I put my knowledge here, trying to find out what could be interesting for distinguishing between the malicious and the clean profiles. Um, so I selected the mean time between tweets, the frame follower ratio, the tweets to non-receivers, tweets to non-receivers, percentage of following being followers, percentage of profile tweets with link, percentage of profile tweets to someone, percentage of profile tweets uh, retweet, and number of PSUs. Okay? So, you can see here how some of these uh, features are not very useful. In this case, it's the mean time between tweets. I thought that this would be a very good feature. Like if someone is sending, let's say, 10 tweets in five minutes, this is a clear indication that this is a bot. But apparently, it's not a very good strategy. You can see how here the red and the blue samples are all mixed together. So this is not a very good feature to use. However, in the case of tweets uh, to someone, it's much better. It does not mean that you can just uh, distinguish between good and bad uh, profiles just using this one. But looks like this can be used in combination with some others to help you distinguish the profiles. So there is also a lot of um, different that you can use for feature selection. I use all of them. And this is my final subset of features that I use for my classification problem. Number of vias, tweets to someone, tweets with link, following followers, friend follower ratio, tweets to non-receiver, and tweets to a non-receiver. So let me show you the results. Um, I use also different algorithms. I first discretize the, uh, the input. And I use uh, ID3, which are decision trees. Uh, naive base, probably you heard about that when back in school. Multilayer perceptron, basically this is a neural network. And RBF network, the difference between the RBF and the multilayer perceptron is a kernel function. In this case, we are using a Gaussian function. But just forget about all the mathematics behind. What is interesting here is that it was possible to correctly classify 91% of the samples using this uh, machine learning. Uh, algorithm. And it was not that hard. What I want to encourage you is to use this kind of uh, technique when in classification problems because it's very simple and you don't need to really understand the mathematics behind. Um, just for you to know, I use the same thing, trying to distinguish also between hack accounts. I basically include a third tag here. And I was able to classify correctly 80% of hack accounts which was quite surprisingly, but I have some ideas why this happened. If I have time, I will explain to you later. So let me tell you a little bit about how the bots are trying to avoid detection. Because you can imagine that, of course, Twitter is using this kind of techniques to detect uh, all these fans running in their network. So what are they doing trying to avoid that? Um, in this case, this is one example. Hungry for some pizza, have Domino's and get a coupon here. All of them sending the same message. In this case, they are not avoiding detection, of course. This was shut down in a few minutes. But for instance, one of the tricks that the bots are doing is trying to avoid semantic analysis. 
you can imagine some of the features, some of the derived features that I use are very easy to calculate, but some of them are very hard. Um, in the case of semantic analysis, it's quite hard. If you want to analyze, just imagine um, you can tweet in any language, and nowadays, if you see some tweets, it's all plenty of acronyms and names and everything, so it's difficult to know if this is legitimate or not. But in this case, they were trying to avoid detection by what is known as a bag of words. Basically, if you get like a bag of different words that are suspicious and you analyze the tweets, you can say this guy is sending something that looks suspicious or not. Um, if you see the same one, the, the first one, sorry, if it's do you, me, your, my, do, it might be fine. Okay, it's not my broken English. In this case, I think it's quite a random message using some words that probably will be deleted for any semantic analysis. Because for semantic analysis, you won't like the verbs and you, will like, you won't like uh, some keywords. In this case, probably you will get rid of all of the adverbs and do's and me, your, and everything. So this way they are avoiding semantic analysis, just using random chit chat messages. Um, if you are looking for relationships, like the distance in the relationship graph between your, uh, the profile that you are analyzing and some known malicious profile or something like that, this is very, very difficult to do. It's extremely expensive in computational sense. Because you can imagine that it's not the same just playing with some features that you can easily calculate than playing with a full chart and calculating distances and relationships and everything. Still, you can see that some of the analyzed profiles, they have no followers, they have no friends, they are not following anyone. So in this case, it's very easy to see that probably they are uh, malicious. Uh, so what they try to do is create clusters. You create like 20 new profiles, 100 new profiles, and they are friends of each other and following each other. So this way, if you look at the relationships attributes, you can see that uh, they don't look so suspicious. But at the same time, if you discover that one of these clusters is malicious, you can shut it down uh, at once. Or uh, you can just overflow Twitter with fake profiles, which is the most common technique used by all. So if you are curious about that and you want to know how to do it yourself, I have here some tools and some ideas that you may use for your own research if you like that. So first of all, one of the things that I've been asked most is how do I find malicious profiles? Well, it's not so hard. If you remember from one of the first slides, the little funny pic of you, just look for that in Twitter, and you will get some hundreds of profiles. And if you look at them, they are saying exactly, uh, they, they have sent exactly the same tweet. So basically, this is a set of bots, and they have this phrase into uh, their vocabulary. And you can see also that some of the profile pictures are repeat as well, are being used, are being reused for more than one profile. So this is another way that you have for looking for malicious content. In this case, for instance, uh, Carl Meissner 9 and with a Walkerly 86 and Devon Trout 92. Uh, okay, there were like 100 with this one. I didn't put them all. But you can see how it is quite easy to find out malicious profiles that are using the same feature. This is better for Twitter. For us, it's harder to find. But also, you can see the profile description. In this case, for this campaign, uh, it was um, a porno website or something. And you can look for that and find some other uh, profiles using exactly the same description. Um, also, these profiles are being reused depending on the, who is paying for that. So for instance, if you remember this picture from the first Profiles. It was used by a lot of different profiles like Adriana Dixon, Mark, Lee, Terry, and all of them. But if you check them one week later, uh, this is the new Adriana Dixon, and 
all of them changed the profile feature because they started working in a new campaign. Because when I'm searching for this campaign, I find out uh, one campaign uh, with Justin Bieber <laughs> accounts, and they were reacting to some the 50 most embarrassing Justin uh, Bieber pictures, something like that. So, yeah, that's true. I mean, one thing is playing that like a small for a private experiment, and one thing is trying to play that like for the whole Twitter. So, what I'm trying to explain here is not like the solution for Twitter or filter out a message, otherwise I will be working there or something. But I'm just explaining how to apply some machine learning techniques for some problems, and I use Twitter. So back to this campaign, there were like 5,200 profiles, and they were creating like 250 new ones every day. So you can see how the reuse ratio and the creation ratio for this kind of uh, campaigns is quite high. Um, basically, when they were created, they had no, they were following no one. They had a few followers. Um, but yeah, it's quite obvious that you can use for filter out uh, malicious profiles when created. Uh, I put all the top tweets sent together. And there were 1,800 different tweets. Do you see any pattern? Yes. I don't know why, but all the 1,800 different tweets had hot. Um, when you see the landing page, well, <laughs> maybe it is related, um, but you can see here that in this case, this landing page, well, probably you don't see, but you see something like likes there. And the, my likes is the. Um, company who was uh, promoting this campaign. My likes is uh, the largest advertising network for the people web. It's a social media advertising platform for advertisers and social publishers. So basically, these guys created the 5,000 bots, and they are using them for whatever you ask them for. But hey, this is digital marketing. This is not a spam. So one uh, website that I like very much for doing this kind of experiments is follower want. Basically, here you can uh, you can search uh, for different profiles, like for the profile description, and then you can order for different criteria, like following followers, they sold, etc. So I think this is a very good source if you are interested in that for like uh, detecting new profiles that could be used in malicious campaigns. Um, but this is not only limited to Twitter. In this case, this website belongs to some malicious campaign from Twitter. Uh, it was jobdeals.com. Um, if you check this website in Alexa, you get uh, very good information as always. Uh, you can see how it's quite recent. In April, um, they got quite a lot of visits. But if you look at the upstream and downstream sites, it's not only limited to Twitter and the shortener, but also to Facebook. So basically, this website was used in a spam campaign for Twitter and for Facebook, which is quite interesting because basically they are trying to use the same campaigns not only in one social network, but in several ones. So conclusions from my talk today. Well, you have seen how it is very easy to find anomalies and how you can use very easily some machine learning techniques for um, detecting these anomalies. Um, I want to show you some of the tools before I go that I use for this to search and that may be useful for you as well. The first one is Weka, if you know it or not. Um, this is a very good tool. Basically, it implements all the machine learning algorithms. So you can just put the data here and play with them and see which ones are giving you the best results and then, uh, well, you do that before going into production, right? The 
second one is SIG Learn, uh, machine learning in Python. Basically, uh, this is a set of libraries that you can use if you like to implement uh, in Python, as I do. And you can have access to a lot of different uh, cool stuff. And also the R project for statistical computing. R is, uh, um, is a computational language. So basically it has a lot of libraries for data mining, importing data, and doing cool stuff. So that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. And we have some time for questions. I mean, the more information you have, the better. Um, you never know which will be like the key feature that you can use for a better classification. Um, even if I got like, I don't remember from the beginning, but it was like uh, 30, 13,000 profiles or something like that. It's a small number compared to, the, to Twitter. So basically, this should be considered like a small experiment, but not to be applicable to a large scale. Um, but I'm sure that in Twitter they will have a lot of more information. As you said, some of it uh, is not uh, public. Um, also, probably they are calculating in real time like relationships and this kind of stuff that is very hard for you to calculate just with public data. But if they do it in a regular basis, you can use it for uh, your features for, for the sample. So yeah, I mean, for classification, the most information you have, the better. Well, basically what I did is use the filters that are included in, in Weka. But basically you are normalizing the data from the biggest to the uh, uh, smallest value that you see. Um, this kind of filters are very simple. If you want to put like some weight more in some of the features, you can do that manually. But, well, uh, the results were quite good, so I don't feel like I could stress out some of the features more to get better results. I played with that, but randomly. I was not like, oh, this future I'm sure I will get more results. Uh, yeah, definitely it's a good strategy. Um, if you want to go deeper into data mining and machine learning, of course, you should do that. You should know what is happening behind in the learning, uh, uh, the learning algorithm and everything. You have like different learning ratios depending on the algorithm. You can use different strategies for the training uh, sample, uh, training set, and everything. Thank you for your time.